back, everyone. We're here in Washington, D.C., sitting in the office of Representative Louis Gomar. We're here to talk about election fraud, what's coming up on January 6th, and where things stand with the different legal challenges in the U.S. right now with these elections. Representative Gomar, it's a real pleasure having you on the show. It's great to be with you, Josh. Thank you. Now, so first off, everyone's wondering, I get, you know, of course, with January 6th, you filed this lawsuit against Pence, arguing again that this... In his official capacity. Mm. I like our vice president very much. Nothing personal in his official capacity. Just want that clear. Of course. Which would, of course, change his powers back to the way it was during the time of the founding fathers, because it was changed Correct. through means that didn't really amend the Constitution. Exactly. Uh, if you could explain to us exactly what you intended with that and what, that, what really that was, could you tell us? Well, it's, it's something that happens here in Washington when... Uh, when people know they cannot pass a constitutional amendment, they'll pass a legislative act, and if neither side challenges it, then it stays on the books and goes along. But as anybody, you don't have to graduate from law school to know you cannot amend the Constitution with a legislative action. Uh, but that's what they did, and of course, uh, you know, when, when Jefferson was vice president, he was in that position to decide on electors, and he decided on the electors that made him president. And uh, I don't know, that may be one of the reasons that John Adams didn't hang around for the, uh, the inauguration. Uh, I believe he's the only president we've ever had that didn't stick around for the inauguration. He just went on that morning early. But uh, Jefferson did it, but in 1887, Electoral Count Act was passed that took away the power that the Constitution gave Jefferson, would enabled him to decide he would be president. Uh, but they didn't amend the Constitution. So the Constitution is still as it was. Now, the 12th Amendment did amend the Constitution, and that was a good thing. That was 1804, I believe. Uh, but that was... Uh, they realized after, well, up to then, we had the Electoral College, but the second highest vote getter became vice president. And, you know, if you can imagine, um, say, Hillary Clinton being, <laughs> being Donald Trump's vice president, or, or it, it, well, I guess I could imagine Mitt Romney being vice president for President Obama, but, but in most cases, it wouldn't work. And they realized then this didn't work. So 1804, they said, okay, no longer the second highest vote getter. It's the guy that gets the most votes for vice president on the team that uh, becomes vice president. So anyway, uh, so we did have the 12th Amendment. And, but 1887 Electoral Count Act did not change the Constitution. Nobody's ever challenged it until now. And unfortunately, the courts uh, have said they use their uh, their procedural gimmicks that are there for them to say, we don't want to touch this hot potato, which is what has happened in our case. They said, you don't have standing as a member of Congress. Well, other plaintiffs were electoral college voters. One of us should have had standing. And I would submit both of us had standing. But the court decided this was too hot a potato, so we'll use the standing claim and, and pass it on. And the Fifth Circuit did the same thing. Nope, we pass. We don't want to take that up. And so um, we should get something filed before the Supreme Court, uh, before Wednesday. So you're working on something new. Can you tell us about this? Well, actually, it's just an application for a stay, for writ of uh, certiorari that would allow the Supreme Court to, uh, to take the case up. Uh, under our laws, uh, the Supreme Court, in this kind of case, has total discretion in whether they would grant a writ of certiorari uh, so that they would take the case up, hear argument, review the briefs, have argument and decide the case. Um, that's different from the case that Texas filed against other states. Uh, that, under the Constitution, is a matter of original jurisdiction for the Supreme Court. 
They don't have any choice. They have to take up cases. There's no other federal court that can take that. But of course, as we know, after Texas filed that, the Supreme Court said, no, we don't want to get in the middle of that. So they passed on it as well. Now, I think this brings up an important point that a lot of Americans right now are concerned about the integrity both of the systems of justice and of the system through which we elect our leaders. I'll be one of those who's concerned, yes. And I think there's a lot of concern, again, that if we lose these two institutions, if people, even if it, you say they do have integrity, but just by losing faith in them, what does that mean for the country? What would you tell these people who have these concerns? Well, as, as I used to say as a judge, um, this is, you know, the last bastion of civility for deciding conflicts. And, you know, that's why I didn't mind citing people for contempt in the court if they were disrupting that civility. Um, now, here in Washington, as we've seen this week, the Democrats say, you can't say the words. We're going to act like we're Google and Facebook and Twitter, and we're going to censor anybody that says words that we find disgusting, like mother, father, son, daughter. So as of this evening, uh, those are all banned from being used on the House floor. Um, that's not the way to promote civility. You know, you go back and during the revolution, it was usually attributed to Voltaire. I've seen some people say, no, it wasn't original with Voltaire, but whatever, he usually gets the attribution. I disagree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. That was said frequently in the revolution. Nobody should be able to censor our speech. We disagree, fine, but you know, I'll defend to the death your right to say it. And many have defended that right to the death. Then along comes the Democratic majority and they say, oh no, we're going to, we, if we disagree with what you say, we're gonna destroy you, destroy your family, we're gonna censor you, hopefully put you in jail. It's a long way from where we were when this country got founded. And it's time that we protected that. But when the institutions that were created to resolve disputes, legislature is a place to resolve disputes, and courts are, that's what they're designed for, to resolve disputes. So when they don't do their jobs, then that civilization is in great jeopardy. I'm not promoting violence. I've not ever promoted violence. I do not advocate for violence, but it doesn't as prevent me as a historian from noting what happens when our institutions to, to resolve things without violence don't do their job. So I know some of the media criticisms have, have accused you of calling for violence because you yeah. called on protesters to meet the same levels as Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Uh, what, was the, well, what, was the, what was the real story here? Yeah, and I not calling on people to uh, rise to the level of Antifa and Black Lives Matter. I was saying uh, the message when courts designed to resolve disputes amicably or civilly, when they don't do their job, then that sends a message to people, uh, not me, but to people that, gee, you're gonna have to get violent like uh, these other groups. And of course, the rumor is floating around that the Supreme Court, uh, that perhaps Chief Justice Roberts didn't want to take up uh, the Texas case between states because uh, there may be riots uh, being apparent, if that were true, and I don't know, that was what was floated out there. Apparently, there were a couple of sources from what I understand, but um, it that sends a message to people that are not me, that people that that uh, feel like they've gotten jerked around and so they're not getting justice as was intended and certainly not equal justice under the law. And it does seem to telegraph to them, you, you've got to resort to what BLM and Antifa does if you're going to, to prevail. I don't want that. I want the courts to do their jobs. And if they will just do their jobs 
We don't have to worry about that whatsoever. And that's not a threat, it's just an observation as a historian. That's the way it goes. And I hope and literally pray that, you know, we will use those institutions and those institutions will do what they've been designed to do. Now, when, when people perceive, I think, government and the systems, the systems of justice these days, it's a little different from how it was perceived in these, when these institutions were first established. At that time, of course, people had discrepancies. They had, you know, ways that they wanted to get recourse. They wanted to have their yeah. cases, you know, brought forward. And these were meant to eliminate mob rule, essentially. Exactly. People, people taking justice into their own hands. Now that you mentioned people are losing, well, as we discussed, people losing faith in these institutions, and we see actual mob rule on the streets even possibly, allegedly, affecting the mm -hmm. willingness of judges to take up cases. What do you think the direction is for this country, and what do you think can be done about this? Well, hopefully we're going to get uh, um, a ruling come Wednesday, or, or if there's a stay, whenever it is, uh, that, that we're not going to accept fraudulently voted electors' votes. We're not accepting fraudulent electors' votes. That, that's, it's just wrong. And unfortunately, every institution along the way that could have stopped the fraudulent uh, electoral votes failed us. This is the last possible stop. And so it is critical that we stop the fraudulent result. There's, there's, and let me just say, any media that continue, and I heard one today, say allegations of fraud are completely unfounded, completely baseless. Well, for anyone to say that, they are either lying or Perhaps they are an accessory, intentionally being an accessory to the theft of this uh, presidential vote. Or they are so busy with other things, they've not bothered to look into the fraud to realize just how widespread. I mean, all of the old school forms of fraud, dead people voting, people voting more than once, all those kind of old style fraud votes that occurred. People voting for other people, uh, all of those kind of things occurred. But because Congress meddled where I didn't think they should have back in 2001 and required every county or parish in America to start using electronic voting, I said back at the time, I was on the bench as a judge, good grief, this is going to end up having the winner be whoever has the best hacker. I said that back in 2001. Congress should have left that alone, left it to the, uh, to the counties. I mean, counties that had just used nothing but paper ballots were better off than what was foisted on them by the U.S. Congress. So hopefully we'll go back and we'll, we'll fix some of those things. Uh, but one of the things that advocates are saying is, uh, and actually, the Texas Constitution requires that there be paper ballots that are uh, numbered in order, you know, and, and that didn't happen in Texas. But it sure helps you uh, account and identify fraudulent votes. Didn't happen. Well, and that brings up another point, which is that in addition to all the, I guess, normal forms of fraud, and in addition to even the issues with the machines, there was also the problem, as a lot of people perceived, that laws were changed in ways that were not necessarily legal. That's right. That it got, you know, governors were, of course, changing the laws by bypassing the state yep. legislatures and something that would go against the Constitution, technically. And so if illegal things were done to make illegal actions legal, then how do you approach this? What's, what's your take? Well, that's where you need the courts to assist in resolving those disputes. 
And if the courts won't, then it, we need the legislature. And in this case, the last stop is the House and Senate here in Washington. So that's where the buck is going to last stop. And I know there are people uh, who are saying we should not overrule anything that comes from the state. But when the systems have broken down in the state, our only chance to salvage the system is for the last remaining stop with the constitutional authority that Jefferson had uh, to recognize non-fraudulent electoral votes instead of fraudulent electoral votes. So we're going to be laying things out on Wednesday to uh, establish what those are. Well, and that brings up the next big point, which is when Wednesday comes around, January 6th, and the electoral votes are counted, uh, a lot of different <laughs> representatives are going to challenge that. They're going to contest it. Yeah. Tell us about what's going to happen. Well, uh, there will be at least one person that will file uh, an objection for um, what will hopefully be six states. Now, the truth is, I mean, there was fraud in Texas, but Trump won. The fraud was not sufficient to overcome the massive turnout and vote for Trump that he got. And that was on the way to happening in Georgia and Pennsylvania and others. Uh, when the Democrats kicked into high gear, they made some major mistakes, so they got caught. Uh, but so far, Nobody has been willing to say the emperor has no clothes on. They, they, they don't want to be the one that identifies the naked truth. So it's up to Congress. So you'll, you'll see that. So you'll have a House member file objection. And hopefully, you know, we've heard from 13 senators that they plan to object. Haven't heard how many states they plan to object on. But uh, there are six swing states that there was definitely fraud that affected the election. And so hopefully there'll be a senator. But, but the uh, vice president will call the states in alphabetical order. And so when he calls a state, if there is an objection from a House member and a senator, then we end up recessing. Senate goes to their chamber. We stay in our chamber. And then we have uh, two hours of de up to two hours of debate on each state, one hour per side. And uh, then we come back together and uh, see what the House and the Senate vote. Now, you mentioned there was fraud in Texas as well. Will you be challenging it as well? Uh, I don't plan to because this uh, it, it may well have affected some local races and, um, you know, some e maybe even statewide races. I don't know that it did. But this is not about any of those. This is about the presidential election. So if the fraud did not affect the yeah. presidential election in that state, I don't see any purpose to objecting. I do see a purpose to having getting an attorney general or a DA in Texas to pursue the fraud uh, and make sure that people finally are punished for the fraud. But there's no point if the fraud did not succeed in taking the election away from uh, the winning candidate, I don't see a need to object. Otherwise, I would be objecting to Texas. Hmm. Now, we talked about, of course, evidence being brought forward in these different discussions. What, what do you see being brought out in terms of these debates that are going to take place up to, the, up to two hours per challenge? Right. And, well, each member of Congress only gets five minutes. So you could have 12 members of Congress each speak for five minutes uh, for and against the issue of fraud being present. And um, so I would anticipate members of Congress making our case to the public, and I hope people will pay attention. Uh, so that if they will, they will hear evidence and they will understand. They can no longer say that 
the fraud claim was bogus, unfounded, unsubstantiated, debunked. It, it was there. It happened. So that's what I expect. We'll have an hour with the Democrats saying, see no evil, you know, we know nothing, um, we're sure it never happened. Uh, and the best way to be able to do that is to not look into it. Because if you do like Attorney General Barr, because I mean, he didn't do his own investigation, uh, but apparently he had somebody come and lie to him and tell him there was no evidence of any fraud, so he repeated what he was told. Uh, Jeff Sessions did the same thing on some issues where he was lied to. So um, we hopefully will have some Justice Department responses. But one thing we've learned, the state is very, very deep in the Department of Justice, much deeper than I imagined. Um, I told the president for, for a long time that as long as Christopher Wray is there as director of the FBI, you know, people like him, they're not, they're not safe. Because hmm. uh, my opinion is that uh, he took his directive to clean up the FBI to mean you just sweep things under the rug. So we've had FBI agents we know lied. Nobody's being held accountable. We know that Clapper and Brennan lied, misrepresented things even here in Congress. And what has the FBI done under Christopher Wray? Nothing. Now, for a lot of Americans, this is kind of the perception. They, of course, saw the Trump-Russia investigations, allegations of voter fraud. Then they were told that foreign interference in elections can't happen, voting systems, voting systems secure. They were told for years, 2017, 2016, all these problems with voting machines. And they were told by the same people, no problems with voting machines. They've seen uh, government officials, you mentioned mm -hmm. some of them, uh, commit actions and crimes that normal people would go to jail for yep. and not have anything happen to them. They saw double standards when it came to, for example, some of these people committing perjury and not sure. facing charges for it based on political affiliation. Or destroying evidence, yeah, sure. We see now, of course, fraud happening that most, I think most people who have done the research can see plain as day. And we see different media declaring this, you didn't see it, didn't happen. And if you say so, even in the halls of Congress now because of these new rules, <laughs> yeah. maybe they can censor you yeah. because of that. Yeah. Given this state, I, I guess if you were to you know, talk to people who are witnessing all of this happening, if you were to tell them one thing, what would it be? Well, let your senators and your members of Congress know, Republican or Democrat, that you want the fraud identified and stopped, and you don't want fraudulent results in this election, and that will be critical. Uh, you can also, you know, let the vice president know he'll be um, basically presiding over the joint proceedings, and hopefully let Speaker Pelosi know when she presides over just the House provision that you expect fraud to be identified and efforts to end it and not let fraud carry the day. Hmm. It, it's critical. It, you know, this is a republic, so it is critical that those, the voters, and by that I'm not talking about illegal voters that vote multiple times or rise from the dead and vote, but legitimate voters, they're the government and they need to make sure their servants know how they expect them to act and how they expect them to vote. And they expect them to stop fraud from prevailing. Hmm. Now, so just given this conversation, we've talked about uh, your different challenges, uh, trying to bring back, of course, powers of the vice president that were removed, but were in the original yeah. constitution. We've talked about some of the accusations against you in terms of talking hmm. about the risk of losing civility in society. I talked about, of course, the different problems we've seen with the election. Um, in terms of your main concerns with all, you know, you're pretty much on the front lines of this. What are your main concerns with what you're seeing? Well, my biggest concern is 
if fraud is allowed to prevail in this election, then we will become a one-party country, that we will become a socialist country. And socialism, it does sound good. Everybody shares, but every time it's been tried, since human beings are not perfect, then it always, always fails. And as, uh, uh, well, <laughs> nobody knew that better than Soshenitz and that spent so much time in the prison in Gulag or prison in Russia. Brilliant, brilliant man. But in his book, Gulag Archipelago, he quotes Dostoevsky as saying, the, and Dostoevsky was responding to these nutcases named Marx and Engels in the late 1800s, and he said, you know, the problem with socialism is not economic. The problem with socialism is atheism. So, and I'm seeing it, the end of freedom of religion, and we're seeing it through the COVID. You know, who would have ever thought that governors or mayors, elected officials, would hammer the churches and vilify the churches and glorify you know, selling marijuana and liquor, but shutting down the churches. I mean, who would have ever thought that? It's, but you're, I'm seeing that, and, it, it, and it's kind of the same type of dislike that grows to hatred that occurred in Europe and Germany before the Holocaust. You see it grow, and as a Christian, when I see anti-Semitism grow against Jews, I mean, that's a miner's canary that tells me they're coming after me next. And if I were Jewish and I saw them going after Christians, I know coming after us next. I mean, it, it's these are warning signs that persecution is going to really kick into high gear once the censorship has its way, and you know the the Christianity. Judaism, the actual practice of these things are vilified, and that's where we're headed. But also, freedom of assembly. Well, we've already seen that, that under COVID, people are willing to give up their freedom of assembly uh, without even a whimper. Uh, you know, freedom of speech. Well, high tech combined with China and our own government is really taking a toll on our freedom of speech. But uh, freedom of the press. I mean, look at what the Obama administration did with freedom of the press. You know, they spied on the press. They got warrants on the press. They jailed, you know, media. Uh, I mean, good grief. It seemed like they, uh, oh, they were got a warrant on one of the Fox News uh, folks and uh, also the AP. And what did the Fox or AP do about it? Let it go with a whimper. You know, gee, that didn't seem right. Uh, but those are the things that all go away when you get where we mo almost are. Those freedoms go away. And also, I have to add, you know, really we're hearing the cries for the end of the Second Amendment which is the great equalizer, keeping government from getting out of hand. Again, I don't promote violent, but just the existence of firearms in law-abiding hands has been a help to keep this little experiment, self-government, going longer than any in the history of the world. Uh, but also, you get into the Fourth Amendment and rights against uh, uh, unreasonable search and seizure. Uh, all of these things, we've been seeing them encroached upon, especially during the Obama administration. And then with the Obama holdovers, what they did to uh, the Trump administration. So he's had four years where he didn't have the freedom to be president without you know, the deep state coming after him. So anyway, it's just a, it's the most dangerous time for our con country's continued existence in my lifetime, and I, I would think since 1945. Hey, Representative Gilmore, real pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. It's great being with you. Sorry if I talked too long. <laughs> no, no, it's great. <laughs>